We are living in an increasingly connected world. And the technology that makes it possible is known as the Internet of Things, or IoT. Now, we all know about the Internet, but what are these things? These are primarily sensors, sensors of all different types. And they could be found anywhere and everywhere, from your living room to workplaces, industrial manufacturing plants, railroad, bridges, aeroplanes, and even in operation theaters. In fact, most of you are either wearing or carrying some of these sensors in the form of smart watches, smartphones. But the sensors that we use today are quite different from the sensors that we were using even 10 or 15 years back. Because the sensors today can not only sense the information from the surrounding, they can process, store, and communicate that information among each other. They can learn from that information, make decisions, and even ask you to take a decision. Think about the car that you drove here. It will ask you to brake if you're too close to the car in front of you. So in a way, the sensors are making our life safer and better. And therefore, the number of the sensors are increasing very rapidly. In fact, at an exponential rate. According to some estimates, there will be one trillion such sensors by the end of this decade. And that's quite impressive. However, there's a problem. Each of these sensors consume energy. And given that there will be so many of these sensors, and their number is simply going to keep increasing, we can immediately run into an energy crisis. So the question is, how do we make this IoT technology more sustainable for the future? And in order to do so, we need to make sure the sensors are extremely energy efficient. Unfortunately, the technologies that we have today are inadequate in solving this grand energy challenge that the IoT technology poses to us today. But the solution can be found in Mother Nature. Think about the living beings. What do they do for their survival? They find prey, escape from predators, locate mates. But how do they do it? By using their sensory skills. So in a way, we are all natural sensors. In fact, you will be amazed to know that animal sensory skill often outperforms what the humans could do. For example, the octopuses possess polarized vision. The barn owl can hunt in complete darkness. African bush elephants can smell water from a distance of 50 miles. Spiders can detect micro vibration. And catfish has an amazing sense of taste. But this is not the only thing that inspires us about these natural sensors. What is even more remarkable is the fact that the sensors are extremely energy efficient. And that's quite natural because most of the animals have to survive in resource-constrained environments. They have very limited food to eat. Their brains are tiny with very limited neural resources and yet they have to process this sensory information and be evolutionarily successful. Think about the insect population alone. There are 10 quintillion of insects. And in the context of what we are talking about, these are tiny sensors. Yet, the total energy consumption by the insect population is far, far less than what we, the human species, consume. So therefore, if we can derive inspiration from nature and somehow mimic the design, the functionality, and the organization of the sensors found in the animal brains, we might be able to solve this imminent energy crisis that we are facing today. And this is precisely what we are trying to do in my lab at Penn State. We are deriving inspiration from nature and building sensors which are sustainable for the future. And in order to do so, we are using an amazing nanomaterial called the two-dimensional materials such as graphene, molybdenum disulfide. These materials are very thin. In fact, they are only one or few atom thick. They are 10,000 times thinner than the hair cells on your body. And yet, they process unprecedented electronic, optoelectronic, chemical, mechanical properties, which allow us to build these bio-inspired and ultra-low power sensors for the next generation. Let me give you a few examples. The first one is collision avoidance. Collision avoidance is very important for many IoT applications, including robotics, autonomous cars, flying drones, and even rovers moving in the extraterrestrial space. But yet, collision avoidance is 
energy consuming when you use the current technology. In contrast, flying insects can avoid collision seamlessly. And among the insects, locust is very special. Now, you may hate locusts for their wide-scale devastation of agricultural field every year, but you must acknowledge their amazing capability to avoid collision. So the locusts move in swarms, and a single swarm can consist of up to a million locusts, which are spread across only a square mile area. Yet, when they move, they don't collide with each other. What is even more remarkable is that there's a single neuron in the brain of the locust that helps it to avoid collision. And that neuron is called the lobular giant movement detector neuron, or LGMD neuron. So when an object approaches the locust eye, the locust uses two visual stimuli. One is the angular projection, and the other is the angular velocity. Now the blue dendritic branch of the neuron uses the information about the angular velocity and creates an excitatory response which increases with time. At the same time, the red dendritic branch uses the information about the angular projection and creates an inhibitory response which decreases with time. And then the LGMD neuron multiplies the two to create a non-monotonic response where the firing frequency becomes maximum before the collision is going to take place. And that allows the locust to fly out in a different direction. Now, given the fact that a single neuron is responsible for this work, the energy consumption is minuscule. So we have derived inspiration from locust and designed a 2D material-based collision detector, which can really detect collision with energy expenditure of less than nanojoules, which is orders of magnitude smaller than what the current technology can do. The second example is sound localization. For any animal, sound localization is very difficult. And the way we do it is by having two ears on the two sides of our head. So whenever a sound comes from a particular direction, it reaches either the right or the left ear first. In fact, you can experience it for yourself now. The people who are sitting on my right will receive my voice in their left ear first, and vice versa for the audience who are sitting to my left. But the time difference between the two signals reaching the left and the right ear is only hundreds of microseconds. But the neurons in our brain can fire only every few milliseconds. And that makes sound localization such a difficult computational task. And the barn owl has simply mastered it. It uses two types of neuron. One is the delay neuron shown by the white lines, and the other is a coincidence neuron, which is shown by the pink circles. And the coincidence neuron fires every time it receives information from the two delay neurons right on top and down. So now if a sound is coming from straight ahead, it reaches both ears at the same time, and therefore the coincidence happens right at the middle. But if the sound comes, let's say, for example, from the right, then it reaches the right ear first and left ear later, and therefore the coincidence happens at a different location. So by finding out where did the coincidence took place, the barn owl can tell which direction the sound came from. So it's a very, very smart neural architecture in the brain of the barn owl, which allows it to convert the information from the time domain to a space domain and solve the problem of sound localization. And this is precisely what we have done using our devices to show that this audiomorphic device can even exceed the capability of barn owl because we can use nanomaterials and nanotechnology. So we learn from nature and try to essentially become or outsmart nature. Finally, let's talk about the dragonfly. Hunting while flying is one of the most difficult computational problems that exist in nature. And you may think about the aerial predators, like hawks or owls, being very successful in this context. But they succeed only 25% of the time. Forget about flying. Think about hunting on the ground. Lions are very successful, yet they succeed only 30% of the time. But when it comes to the dragonfly, their success rate is 100%. They're perfect. So what makes it perfect? There are three things. First, the wing of the dragonfly 
can rotate 360 degrees, independent of each other. That makes the Dragonfly one of the most sophisticated flying machines ever built in nature. In fact, it can fly backwards. Next, it has 360 degree vision, thanks to its compound eye. But what makes the most difference is its tiny, yet very powerful brain, which can predict the future. So the dragonfly feeds on fruit fly, and in order to catch a fruit fly, it needs to predict the future location of the fruit fly based on the current location of the fruit fly and the prior experience of the dragonfly in catching a similar species. And the mathematical basis of this kind of computation is probabilistic. So what goes on into the mind of the dragonfly is a stochastic computing. And that is in sharp contrast to how your laptops, computers, and iPhones work. They are primarily deterministic. So what we have now shown is that by mimicking the architecture inside the brain of the dragonfly, we can also do computation like addition, subtraction, multiplication at an energy expenditure which is much, much smaller than what the traditional computers use. So to conclude, I think that nature is not only beautiful, it is also smart and intelligent. In fact, it provides elegant and yet simple solution to the most difficult technological challenges that we face today. So if we can derive inspiration from nature and make our technology bio-inspired, we can actually make a greener, better, and sustainable future for generations to come. Thank you.